I'm Sean from Arfield Rugby Media. This is Simeon, also known as the TikTok Talker. Hi guys, I'm Murray, also known as Plus Four Rugby HQ. And welcome to Season 2 of the Rugby Connection Podcast. Hope you're ready for it. For the fans. By the fans. Hello and welcome to the latest Rugby Connection interview. This week's guest, 66 caps for Scotland, over 100 appearances for Glasgow, went to Connaught and went to Cardiff as well. It's none other than Dan Parks. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you getting on? Yeah, thanks very much, Murray and uh, and Sean and, and Simeon. Yeah, re- very good, thanks. I'm, um, yeah, I've just finished a rugby session down here in uh, in Sydney, in Sydney, Australia, with uh, Sydney University. So, um, yeah, just had a bit of a spot of dinner and looking forward to having a chat with you guys. We're very looking forward to this. I feel a bit, like, nostalgic because, <clears throat> sorry, when I first got into rugby, you were the starting fly half for Scotland, so that's, this is kind of cool for me. Well, there you go, mate. Yeah, I guess um, I don't know if it's showing my age or not, but yeah, I uh, yeah, mate, I I, um, I really enjoyed my time in Scotland. I, I was very fortunate enough to to get an opportunity to play with Scotland when I when I first went over to Glasgow. I went to um, it was my first experience of being a professional rugby player, so I really hadn't, uh, I guess, mapped it out that I would be um, part of the national setup. But um, it happened pretty quickly, to be honest, and. Yeah, man, it was uh, it was a pretty awesome experience. Yeah, definitely. Just a quick question, just to get us into it. We ask every guest this: um, What actually got you into rugby, Dan? Uh, well, I was I'm a fanatical sports fan, and um, I, I I guess one of my probably my first love was rugby league. And in Australia, that was obviously on the east coast. That was the main thing you sort of supported. And um, as I said, I was fanatical, absolutely fanatical about rugby league, and. Um, Anyway, what happened was I went to a school um, and the high school played rugby. So, you know, it was one of those things I didn't know when I went to the high school what, what sports they played. But obviously, once I got there, I worked out pretty quickly they played rugby union. So um, I just uh, I just shifted from playing rugby league, I guess, to rugby league. And that's how it sort of all came about. That's good. So you, you were actually a cross, cross club player. I didn't know that. So that's always good to know. Well, well yeah, you know, I was 12 years old. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I went to high school, I was, uh, yeah, as I said, I was just, I uh, played league for a weekend team. And, um, and you know, the funny thing is, man, until really, no joke, until 1991, really, I didn't know any rugby players. I know that might sound strange. So as a 12, 13 year old, I didn't even know not one rugby union player, not even Camper. And then, um, yeah, obviously I would have got to know him. I think there was a big ad on TV in the early 90s. Um, and he was on it. It was for Channel 10 Rugby. And, uh, yeah, so then bit by bit, I got more and more into, obviously, rugby. And, uh, yeah, then I just sort of, I guess, went on my way from there. Brilliant. Sean, you got a question for Dan? Yeah. <clears throat> so, Dan, obviously, you played for a couple of clubs this side of the world, Glasgow, Connacht and Cardiff. Do you have a club that you prefer? I mean, maybe that's a bit of an um, unfair question, but is there any club that you prefer? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. So there's no club I really prefer. Obviously, I my first club overseas was Glasgow, so that's always going to have a, a you know a very um, special you know place in my heart, of course. And obviously, it gave me my opportunity to play or to represent Scotland on that that national level. So, yeah, you probably um, in regards to the opportunities. Obviously, Glasgow was the first of the three that I went to, and was lucky enough to experience. Um, and you know, with that with that with that being said, the other two places were were wonderful. Cardiff had a a really enjoyable time. Um, I spent two years there. I uh, loved where I was living there in Cardiff and, and met some, again, one, some wonderful people who I'm still in touch with today. And, and then Ireland, uh, that sort of finished off my career, um, being on the West Coast there. And, and again, that had its special moments. Same thing, you know, it doesn't matter where you go, you always meet lovely people. Um, I guess that's what rug- makes rugby so special. You know, there's always, um, you know, special people and, people that will look after you, especially for a foreigner coming into their country. And um, I must say my, the hospitality I received throughout all the three, um, three nations was, was pretty special for me. All right. I suppose they all probably provided something different today. Yeah, they, they certainly did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember. Um, so when I first got to Scotland, um, my mother would come over uh, once a year and, and visit me and she'd stay for a couple of weeks and, and, and very much in the first, I'd say six to 12 months, I literally, some of the players in the team, especially from the borders, um, the Scottish borders, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Um, 
because you had such a strong, you know, what's considered an, you know, obviously for an Australian a normal accent, and then you come over to um, the UK and and you, you know, you're dealing with different accents, all the rest of it, and yeah, and and she, you know, she would come yearly, and as I said, she took her a good four or five years to actually be able to pick up some accents and be able to understand what they were saying. She'd often say, "What what, what did he just say?" Or, or you know, what because like, she literally could not understand. So that was something I, um, I guess I then almost took for granted because. I, you know, I was ingrained in it. You know, I was dealing with these people day in, day out. So, um, but yeah, it was, a, as I said, it was a, it was a pretty cool time. My experiences overseas. That's class. Simeon, I'll throw it over to you. Well, you mentioned very quickly, you mentioned borders. I've just moved up to Edinburgh from Wales for uni. Mm-hmm. I went to the borders once and did not understand the thing. You can understand yeah, well, Edinburgh borders. <laughs> it was like, I went yeah, on as a referee. No clue. I think it's one of those things, you know, like it's probably the same with Australians, like the different parts of Australia. You you speak in a very slangish or even a very, I don't know what the right word is, Um, you know, you probably don't pronounce your words as well as you probably should at other times. And uh, you just get, it's just a comfort thing. But I think that was more of what it was. Um, You know, and I, again, once I, once I got used to it, it was, it was, I sort of became pretty natural um, for me. But, yeah, it was just, it was just interesting because my mother, she would always – say she couldn't quite pick it up um or understand what people were saying but um yeah that was just one experience obviously and but yeah they all had their um yeah they're certainly their their you know, i guess their their real special qualities um and you know for me it was just a all big package you know i look back now and um it seems like a long time ago but at the time it, it obviously didn't it, it was one of those you know i was away for 12 years and i sort of felt like it was never going to end obviously it does you know as, as, a, as a as a sportsman it always sort of comes to an end but you don't it's hard to sort of think of it while you're in the moment you don't ever think it's going to end but um unfortunately it does no fair enough and on that um you've played all around the world is there a stadium you have a best memory on your favorite stadium to play in across the world I don't know about a favourite stadium. I always enjoyed playing in the Stade de France. I always found that to be a really cool stadium, just in general. Um, played a World Cup quarter final there, so that was a, a real highlight um, of my career to get to a World Cup quarter final. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know the, the obvious ones, the, all the the home. I, I really enjoyed playing in Fir Hill. So when I was at Glasgow, Fir Hill was the the main main ground I played at for all those years. Um, so I, I did enjoy that ground. It was, it was a slightly shorter ground and not as wide as your conventional rugby pitches. Um, you know, we had a really good, well, as a team, Glasgow, we had a good advantage there. Um, good crowd. It was obviously on the one side, but you could really feel that home presence. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and again, I guess when I went to Galway, I, I really enjoyed playing at the sports ground. I think, you know, it's not the most flash of stadiums. I haven't been there for many years now, but good five or six years. But I remember when we played there, it was, you know, it was a bit, um, it was a bit old and, and raggedy. It was, it was starting to come good, but um, yeah, the pitch quality was always, I thought, was always good compared to the early days. But um, yeah, and then again, same thing, mate. When that wind would blow in certain directions, like as a player, and when you're living in Galway, you can get used to it. But as an opposing player, it, I imagine it would be a very difficult place to go. I always used to think when we'd come as a visitor, he never liked coming there. But um, but yeah, I must say when. When you had that home crowd behind you in Galway, it was um it was pretty strong. You know, we had some really good good victories in my last couple of years. Grand, thank you. Murray. Um, yeah, just going on to your after point career, um, how did you actually go about becoming director of Colts for Sydney Uni? Oh, that's only come about very recently. I um I've been sort of well, what I did was when I retired, I, I got involved in a few things, rugby related. I was involved in media. Um involved with um i did a bit of coaching i've done a bit of uh, skill work um and, and as i said all sorts of different things um i really wanted to try the corporate world so i got involved uh in in the corporate world i spent uh, four just four and a bit years in that environment um and i think i just needed to change i actually wanted to get back involved more heavily in rugby and um timing was good just so happened that there was an opportunity at sydney university um, I knew a few of the people that were part of that club and, um, yeah, the uh, opportunity, opportunity arose and it happened very, very quickly. So I found out that the position was available. I think it was on a Tuesday and I think within a couple of weeks I'd, um, I'd agreed to terms and we, and yeah, I've been, um, been going there for the past, um, five or so weeks. So, um, yeah, really enjoying it. Good, good. Glad to hear it. 
that's actually how we got a hold of you because, like, obviously, when when players retire, you're always curious, like, what they're doing now, and obviously, the director is like coaching our punditry, and I think it came up just like on a page that I follow that you got the job, so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, and then we posted a few videos of like you sort on a beautiful kick at Ireland at Crow Park. And yeah, I was just kind of joking with the boys, like, it'd be pretty cool to have Dan Parks on the show. And that's just, that's how it came about. And yeah, so hey. crazy. Well, yeah, yeah. As I said, I, I got handed the email, um, oh, whatever it was, last week or something like that. And and it was raised in a in a conversation or a meeting we had. And I said, oh, I'd be more than happy to have a chat. So yeah, good on you, mate, for reaching out. Thank you. I like that. I like you know? that. I'll, I'll praise you for, like how quick you replied and how keen you were as well, because I woke up, obviously the time difference, <clears throat> and I woke up and I said, that, yeah, mate, looking forward to it, let's agree a date and time, Dan Parks, I was like, this isn't real, this isn't happening. There's no way <laughs> Dan Parks has just emailed me. So that, that's pretty cool, so I honestly can't thank you enough for that. But Sean, no you worries. got any more questions for Dan? Yeah, um, Dan, what, let's say, what advice would you give to yourself or, or maybe a younger 12 or 15 year old who's looking or who wants to kind of succeed in rugby at any capacity? Um, I guess, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think as a coach, you you know, you're always, you're trying to help that next generation. Um, I think the biggest thing, what I'm learning um, in particular about my current role is, um, you know, and I, I was always this person that um, I guess we're willing just to learn, um, keen as mustard, you know, all those things, which is what I was, um, never think you know it all. I think it's important to, to listen as much as you possibly can. Obviously, it's just as important, you know, it's important to speak. But I think listening is a, is a really, is a habit sometimes we, um, or is a trait that we, uh, we take for granted. I think we can learn a lot from just listening to someone else, especially someone who's might have a bit of experience. Um, but I think, yeah, the things like that, uh, they're a massive part of it. I think, uh, you know, certainly... Um, for me, I was always someone that growing up, I didn't want to be a lawyer or a doctor or I wanted to be a professional sportsman. That was my thing. I was obsessed by, as I said, rugby league and, and cricket. And then, um, you know, as I got older and older, um, you know, I, I guess bit by bit, I sort of chipped away and I was, um, you know, I'd take over, you know, at one person or a couple of people in that position and I'd get higher in the pecking order. And then, you know, I kept working. And, you know, what was the, my strengths, obviously, the, my passing. Um, they were things that I never took for granted. But the funniest part, what I really, my whole life, I never looked at working on it. I just looked at it. It was all fun. So I would kick every single afternoon after school for an hour and a half while the wild light was there. So I'd get home from school at 3.45 and I'd be out, have some food, and I'd be outside kicking the ball by 4 o'clock. And that's just what I did. Um, because purely I love to see how a ball would move and how I could manipulate a ball, what I could do to different things on the ball, all these different things. So um, as I got older, obviously I appreciated all those hours I spent um, doing all that type of stuff, which, um, as I said, like now, like you see a lot of these people, they do so much training and blah, blah. And I think, you know, it's because they probably have to, because that might be seen as, well, they're going to be a pro, so they've got to do it. Whereas I guess for me, it was, it was actually fun. It was never, ever a job playing rugby never um so um yeah i think there's uh, again i don't know how to really answer that because i think there's many ants there's many things that make someone um you've obviously got to have you know first and foremost you've got to have talent and i think you've got to be willing to learn and and listen i think if you can um you can sort of blend all those together have a bit of luck along the way you've got to be um you know obviously with things like injuries you've got to get you've got to have good coaches along the way um, but all those things, I think they really do count. It doesn't matter if it's rugby or any other sport. You've got to be, um, you know, I think respectful as well is another another big thing. No, that's a brilliant answer. Yeah, thanks for that. So, I mean, I'm kind of building upon that question um, and talking about like obviously working uni. So you probably a, a uni. So you probably see lots of players doing loads of other different sports. Do you see a benefit, <clears throat> or what and what sports in particular do you see benefit? rugby players is doing like a part-time or like another another thing on the side to do to help increase uh, little skills and things like that into the rugby union? Um, I would say probably no, not not from what I've seen. 
Um, generally, the way it works, you know, you, you, the golf, right? Golf's a, it's a social activity. You know, some people take it seriously, but generally, a lot of people, you know, I find that it doesn't matter what sport, play golf as a bit of an outlet. Um, and you guys would know this. It's, you know, if you pick a sport pretty much from the age of 16, that's your sport. You can't, like the old days, you could play rugby league in this or rugby league in the, or w- rugby in the winter and then cricket in the summer, but you can't do that anymore. You just don't have the time because the seasons go too long and that's what you do. And then when your season's over, you might have a couple of weeks off and then you, you're back into doing, you know, getting fit or whatever it may be to get ready for the next season because it's such long. So, um, you know, I do a lot of crossover skills with my, with, you know, different coaching drills I do. Um, and, yeah, they're all basically hand-eye coordinated top skills. So, you know, catching of different type of balls, for example, and, uh, you know, all, all that style of thing, you know, you might bring – for example, AFL or, or Gaelic football into into your training when you're doing, um, you know, it could be a warm up or it could be uh, a game related um, something, something a bit different to what you're always generally used to on a rugby pitch. You just try and vary it up, but it can somewhat stimulate, you know, different people, and it, it's something a bit different because, you know, it could become quite mundane doing the same things day in day out. Nice, grand, yeah, so that's fair enough. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a question for you, Dan. <clears throat> obviously, <clears throat> obviously, you are director of coach, so you're well into your coaching now. What are your thoughts on your former halfback partner, Mike Blair, coaching at Edinburgh now? Because obviously, you were a dynamic duo. It must be in that position because everyone's coaching from that position now. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I was just texting Mike the other day actually, and um, about something away from, um, you know, his rugby results currently. I. I must say, I um, I, I've been following them, um, and I did. So they were sort of mid-table, and now they've shot up to second. So um, it's great to see. I think some I saw some comment from a lovely fan mentioning how they haven't played in the Orange Irish provinces. I think they said, um, you know, r- rather than concentrating on the the positive and the wonderful story, you know, someone chips in and talks negative. But that's you get that. Um, but yeah, I think uh, no, it's great to see. You know, Mike's first job as a um, as a head coach, he. Yeah, he's had plenty of good mentors. I know Gregor's, uh, Gregor Townsend's had a lot to do with Mike uh, along the way, so he would have certainly learned a lot being around Gregor and, and the staff that Gregor assembled with Scottish, um, you know, with Scottish rugby over the past couple of years. And, yeah, and he's, uh, he's certainly taken this opportunity and it's great to see him doing well. There's a lot of fine, fine players there as well. So they've, um, they've got some good players. Good to see they've brought that uh, the Argentinian fullback, I think, Buffelli, I think that's his name. Yeah. Um, he'll be really good for them. You know, you can kick the ball a mile. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, again, how he, you know, he sort of fits in. We don't get to see a great deal of the, the rugby. There's an app where we can see three-minute highlights of games. But besides that, you don't get a great deal. And um, I think that Ben Velicott, he's a guy from Gloucester. Is that right? Is that where he's come from? Wasps he came from. Was it Wasps, was it? Yeah, he's um, he, great guns. He's, uh, he looks like he's made a huge impact. And again... Pretty clear to see Mike being a scrum half. I'm sure he's having a big impact on what he's doing. So, yeah, no, it's great to see Mike doing well. Um, again, it's great to see Scotland at various times been doing really well in, um, recently. Obviously, Ireland, you know, again, they seem to be the New Zealand, uh, um, you know, hoodoo team at the moment. It's um, it's really quite incredible how – and that game they played on that day, I don't think I've ever seen a more clinical display. It was absolutely superb. Could see Sean Grennan in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> it was. It was. It was. As I said, it was. It was really wonderful to watch. Like the, the things they were doing and the accuracy of what how they performed. You know, no, I don't think anyone would have beaten them on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan, I was actually just going to ask you. For me, when when you play for Connacht, one win that kind of stand stand stood out for me was that win away to Toulouse in 2013. But do you have across mm. your career for all the clubs that you played for, even for Scotland, do you have a, like a, a favourite game or win that you played in that was kind of your favourite that stands out to you? Um, well, funnily enough, the, the, I, that game in Toulouse was a, was a great result for us at that Connacht. Um, uh, I think, what was the score? 16-12, I think it was, when we beat them? Yeah, that, yeah something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. In 12, um, Danny Pullman scored in the try uh, in the corner. Uh, yeah, and I think it was 16 12. Uh, that was a great result. I think my very first game I played for Connacht was against Leinster. 
Um, and we we had a really good victory. I think we won 34 to 6 maybe or something along those lines. Um, and that was at the sports ground. So I'd, I'd come off a, a calf injury in the preseason. So I didn't play until round five and that was my first game. Um, and yeah, that was that was certainly a highlight. But there was other great, we, we had a great run against B Ritz as well that first year I was there. Um, and I think uh, Cardiff, oh, there was, there was some really good results we had for Cardiff. Um, I really enjoyed playing in the, the city stadium, which we played at. Uh, for those couple of seasons, um, we had some good results. We had a good win against London Irish, I remember, away, which got us into the uh, the Heineken Cup quarterfinals. And unfortunately, we came up against a red hot uh, Leinster in uh, Croke Park in the quarterfinal, and they completely blew us away. Um, but uh, and then Glasgow, yeah, there was, you know, obviously, I was at Glasgow the longest, I was there for seven years. Um, again, some of those European victories were, were very special, but. The big game for Glasgow was always the the uh, the matches against Edinburgh in the big uh, the big you know the double header we'd play around Christmas New Year time, and I'd probably say the oh nine ten was the most memorable. We um we played uh, Edinburgh at home in the first game and we had a, a a really good win. We won quite convincingly at home, so we held a, a decent was the eighteen seventy two cup. I think that's what's called. Yeah, yeah. So we had a really good win against them in that in that first round and then so we had a, a reasonable lead but um we went on and beat edinburgh in the next game as well um up at edinburgh that, that uh, i think it was early january so yeah they, they, they were always big games the, the edinburgh ones and again you know we talk about mike blair he was always instrumental in you know me and mike obviously we squared off on many occasions but then had a great relationship when it came to um you know our international commitment so yeah there was many Again, mate, guys, you know, we're talking about 11 years of playing, so there's lots and lots of games and um, lots and lots of victories in there, which you'll never forget. We had a great win for Glasgow, actually, against um, a small little four-year-old, just not happy about going to bed. Um, but that we had a great result against, um, again, it was Toulouse playing for Glasgow in 2009. We were complete underdogs, complete underdogs, and we were... Um, it was a Sunday game, and I remember turning up to the game. And Sean Lenine said to us in the um, in the hotel, he basically said, "No one gives you a chance. Literally, no one gives you a chance. Um, so I want you guys. Shackles are off. Just actually go and enjoy yourselves. Play how you think you should play." And it was the freest I'd ever been before a game because we had you know Tom and Max in the team. Um, you know, we had the, the Killer Bees going. Kelly, Kelly Brown, Johnny Beatty, and Johnny Barkley. They were on fire that day. Um, you know, it was just one of those days where we just, everything we did, we, it was wonderful. We led 33, nine with, uh, like six minutes to go. And, um, and the score got to 33, 26, mind you, but we, uh, we had a big lead and, uh, it was just, yeah. And that was a really special day because again, we were never, ever, um, you know, almost expected to be on the same ballpark as them. And yeah, somehow we managed to win. So, yeah. And that can happen at times. You can, you know, get, catch a team by, by surprise because, you know, at, at full strength, they were certainly stronger than us. But that's the beauty of sport. You know, if you get them on, if you have a really good attitude, brings me back to my earlier comments about um, about coaching kids. Is if they, you can have a really good attitude and a bit of luck goes your way, then, you know, anything's possible. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm sure you'll have, you'll never forget those feelings of those, those highs and lows throughout your career. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, too right. It's great. Yeah. So, I mean, and there was many posts. There was many posts. Believe it or not, there was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were certainly well documented at the time. But um, yeah, as I said, I'm more a more a, a you know positive person. Try and talk about the positives of life rather than the the things not so. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. Yeah. So, nice, so, right. I mean, if I'm correct in thinking, weren't you the first Scotsman or some Scotland player to play for Cardiff? Oh, mate, possibly. Oh, I, I don't know about that stat, but it could be the case. I can't think of anyone, you know, anyone else. I know that, and you'd know this more than me, that there was a, a big um, New Zealand contingent that was present when I was there. Um, Are we allowed on New Zealand as the Welsh? We just nick them all the time. Well, yeah, you guys, you know, well, I was lucky to play. I had Paul Tito was my captain with Casey Lalala. And Unfortunately, Ben Blair didn't play too often, but he was part of that squad. He was always injured, unfortunately. Very, very sad. Um, you know, Xavier Rush. 
trying to think if there's anyone I've missed there. Um, like Michael Patterson, he was a back row that came over. Um, yeah, so yeah, there was always plenty of Welsh guys. Do you around like, Cardiff and good players. Very good do you players. have a favourite thing about Wales or memory in Wales in general? Um, no, no, I just, I, I to be honest, I lived in Pont Um, and I, oh, yeah. the food, so I just, yeah. I, I just really where I was, you know, we had a lot of the. Well, again, a lot of the, the New Zealand guys um, that live nearby. I was good pals with Richie Reese, you know. So it was, you know, it was just a. a I really enjoyed um, Tom Brown. Um, I just really enjoyed my my time there. I had some really good mates that I um, spent a lot of time with off the park, and um, yeah, it was just. I just found that to be a, quite a good um, place for that. Um, I obviously, you know, enjoyed Cardiff as a city. It was it was wonderful, and I enjoyed the uh, the setup we had out at the Vale. I don't know. Are the Blues still there? Are they out of the veil? No, they got kicked out of the veil. Um, okay. When was it? During COVID, they got kicked out of the veil, I believe it was. Or just, no, it was just before COVID. The summer before COVID, they got kicked out of the veil. Um, mm. And they, all had to, they had to train at Arms Park for the whole summer. Uh, oh, that, I'm sure there's worse places to train than there. So that. Oh, it's lovely, Arms be, Park. Oh, yeah, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But um, yeah, and, and you know, we were very fortunate. We, um, we, were, we were able to play at. Um, at the Ryder Cup course down at Newport, so that was that was always a highlight. I enjoyed playing, as I mentioned, golf earlier on. So I was, yeah, quite often would play there with um, with Casey and uh, um, Bubba Andrews. Is he still around at Cardiff these days? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there was again. Benny Blair loved his golf, but yeah, there was. Yeah, it's like anywhere, mate. In rugby, there's everyone. Most people like uh, you know doing th- things, obviously off the off the rugby park, trying to get their mind away from it. So, yeah, no, Cardiff was great fun for that. My grand, thank you. Um, Dan, you mentioned, like, some of the iconic players that you've played with in your career. Is there any current player, doesn't matter what team, what country, is there any player you'd love to have got the opportunity to play with? Um, oh, well, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's certain players right now who are, you know, top of their game, obviously, yeah, Mercurial Finn. There's no question he is extremely special. Might have been tricky though, considering he played in the same position. But <laughs> I would have, um, I certainly would have loved to have been around playing. You know, even if it was a uh, part of a squad with Finn, because he seems to be a good character off the park. Um, I've had a com- few conversations with Finn um, many years ago while I was, you know, still in the UK uh, when he was just coming through. So, um, but he's absolutely excelled over the years. It's been wonderful to watch. Um, I think Michael Hooper. Um, he's just a, a phenomenal athlete and player. Um, you know, I wouldn't say he's blessed with the most incredible amount of skill, but he, he, when you talk about people giving their all and trying their guts out, there is no one that personifies that more than him. He is quite incredible. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd probably point out those two blokes. And, you know, there's, uh, there's obviously others out there. I was lucky enough to play with a lot of really good players, you know, to play with someone like Jamie Roberts when I was at Cardiff was a, you know, it was a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, he was always a bloke that you sort of, you knew you were in for a tough game when you're up against him. Um, uh, who else can I think of? I think that's, yeah, as I said, there's there's plenty. I probably can't think of them on the spot, but you know, those names mentioned, they were always, um, you know, I think they're, they're pretty they're pretty good players at the moment. I think maybe some of the big South African second rowers, I think um, like an Ebonets a bit, uh, back is both of these type of real tough men. Would have been pretty cool to play with. Yeah, that's fair. And just for your to solve the who goes at ten, you are fun. You could always do the ten twelve dynamic if need be. So there you go. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be playing twelve then because I don't hit up. That wouldn't be me. <laughs> there you go. Ben, yeah. ben can go twelve and Dan Parks can go at ten. There you go. Uh, you go no, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Exactly right. So I probably wouldn't work. But um. Yeah, no, he's he's done really well. It's it's been great to see him. Obviously, he's he's flying high over there in um in Racing. Actually, I did notice they they've slipped down the ladder recently, which is a bit of a surprise. Yeah, that's, that's Sean's yeah. good. Sean's our top fourteen, top fourteen. Yeah, no, you're right. You're, you're right, Dan. They, they have they they lost to Bordeaux there two weeks ago, and like they were, I think they were leading like by twenty five points, and and then um, Bordeaux came back and won by four points in the end, so they didn't score in the second half. So you are right about that. Wow. Wow, okay. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Nice. Yeah. Um, Dan, yeah, last question for me, Dan. Um, 
what are your thoughts on the new 5022 um rule and a follow-up question one of our friends from the podcast carwin asked if that law was in place during your day how many how many do you think you get during one game well, i think it's a, i think for me personally i think it's a great rule i think it um you know it, it obviously you know, as you know, you're trying to manipulate the backfield right as much as you possibly can. So if you can somehow get the ball back from kicking a 50-22, just like in league with a 40-20, um, I reckon it's a bit harder to do a 40-20 in league than what it would be to do a 50-22. Like, that was, you know, I'm sure you can go back on some Six Nations games, but that was a favourite kick of mine was just to turn them around, kick it in behind the wingers, and obviously you need that roll or that skid to get you into the corner. But, yeah, I, I, it would have been something I would have, I would have loved to have had in our arsenal, if we um, if we certainly were, especially with Scotland, because we had a, a strong line out, uh, especially towards my last couple of years with Al Kellogg, uh, skipper there. We had some, um, you know, we had some really good forwards that were really good at line out, and we could have, you know, certainly I reckon done some damage in that regard. But yeah, it's a, I, I think it's I think it's a really good rule. As I said, I think it, you can manipulate the backfield. You know, you can, you know, if you do it a few times, obviously then the wingers are going to be mindful of sitting back and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, I think there's ways in which the the coaches, I'm sure, will you know, over time get to understand it a bit more and really try and manipulate those backfields because, you know, if you can do that, then you'll create more space in the front line. Yeah, I mean, that's what we want to see as well, more space, more, you know, well, attack I've, space, as you said. I've, I've had many of these kind of conversations, you know, we're talking about how teams used to play in the in the 80s and the early 90s, and I think the reality was is that, that defence wasn't, well, it was there, but it wasn't necessarily a discovered thing you know the the attack seemed to be what you spent most of your time on whereas now you know it's almost like defense has overtaken the attack in regards to time spent so that's why the defense is so hard to break down there they're literally especially at top level it's very very difficult so if that you know if that could add a little bit extra to the um as i said to the minds of those um coaches or players that are trying to break down teams and if that kick option is one and then you know can keep a, a player or you know, out of that defensive line then you know more strength to it yep very fair so I mean oh, no, I'm, I'm all good on questions there I've got one more and then we've got a few fan questions just to round up as well um, what are your personal aims for this season and for your overall coaching career Dan oh, I think it's a step by step process to be honest um, I've done coaching before but not on a um, I guess a director level or a head coach level so um, I, I think you know, I, I don't. I, I think results, as in you know, trying to win a premiership, all that type of stuff. I think, I think that's just a byproduct of. Uh, I guess you know, I'd like to think that we'll have some really good players in there. We'll create a, a really good program. People want to be part of, and I think that to me is ultimately what it's all about. Everyone enjoying what they're doing, but <clears throat> you know, getting the most out of it and getting the most out of their talent. I mentioned earlier on, you know, you've got to have talent, and then you've just got to add the extras onto it. But if you've got the right attitude. With a sprinkling of talent, you can, you can go far in the game. Um, yeah. Me, <clears throat> so I would say for me, it's more about um, you know getting these guys that I'm I'm currently working with to be better athletes, better people. I think that's a massive part of it as well. I think the more and more you can, someone can grow as a man. Um, I think the better he'll be as a sportsman. To be honest. Yeah, completely agree, and I like that. It's very calm down on your focus. I like that you're not like dreaming too big. You're focused on on the job at hand and kind of respect that a little bit as well. Um, we've got a few fan questions just to finish off. Sean already mentioned one. Our good friend Carwin ha- asked, um, what were your emotions after Wales 2010? But he wrote a side note saying that you might have felt a bit shit after it. So can you take any positives from your performance against Wales in 2010? Oh, yeah, that was a great night. Like, uh, Sorry, great afternoon. We, um, you know, I didn't play in that first test. I hadn't played for... A- for a good while for Scotland. Um, I got included in that second second game, which was obviously against Wales. Millennium it was where I had got my first cap back in 04. And, yeah, we sort of went there. Again, I was really comfortable with the players I was playing with. There was quite a big contingent of Glasgow players who were having a very good year with the Warriors that year. And, yeah, I just felt comfortable going there. Um, we were, in, again, 24-10 in control. Um, unfortunately, we got two sin bins you know, you can sort of look at it and go, well, they weren't ideal. There's a crossfield kick that was put across, I think, Stephen Jones. And I've never seen this to date. The ball bounced. It literally landed a, set, a centimetre in from touch and it bounced backwards. 
um, straight over Sean Lamont's head, straight into, I think it was Shane Williams' hands. Um, it could have been Lee Halfpenny, actually. And uh, anyway, recycle the ball and then they score. But, for example, if that ball just touches the line or just bounces the other way, it, it was pretty much game over. Um, you know, that happened. We had two sin bins. And unfortunately, um, yeah, we lost. Shane scored that ridiculous try right at the end. And that was heartbreaking. But we were completely broken, mate. I, I had I had cramps right at the end. I had to go off with like four minutes to go because I literally could not stand up. Um and, uh, yeah, it was pretty sad after the game. We, that was a terrible game. I don't know if you guys are aware. That was the day that um, Tom Evans broke his neck. Yes. Um, I remember. Yeah. 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 R- Rory Lamont did his knee. Um, and he did his knee when he was chasing a crossfield bomb of mine. Now, I it was up against Shane. And I think it was, I'm sure it was Shane Williams. And I can guarantee you Rory Lamont would have caught that. Rory Lamont was the best player in the air of a high ball that I played with. And he was, so I think I kicked it, it it might be footage of it, I kicked it from about 15 out straight to the other side of the field on our right wing. And if Rory's leg was working, there's no question he would have easily got there and gone up and competed for that ball. And I can't see how he wouldn't have scored. So um, it was just things like that that sort of happened in that game. So that's when he did his knee. Chris Patterson suffered um, internal bruising and bleeding of his um, ribs. Um, And I'm pretty sure one of the Welsh players broke his arm as well. So... Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I'm sure it was a four. Might have been. Might have been a prop. Was it Duncan Jones? I think you might have been. I I know. I recognise that. That's that. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, it was just. It was one of those games. And to be fair, you know, for me, when I was playing in the game, I wasn't really aware of all this happening. If that makes sense, yeah. like Tom getting. We, what happened was Tom made a, a break. He then. Buggered his neck, dropped the ball. Then Wales went and attacked down the other end of the field, and so we'd literally gone from one side to the other, like a good minute of play, and we're all haunched over. I think Wales might have dropped the ball like two meters out from our line, so we're all waiting because something is going on down the other end of the field, and that's obviously the doctors and everyone else was attending to Tom, but we didn't really understand what was going on, and it wasn't until after the game that we we learned while we were in our hotel room just before the dinner that Tom would never play again, um, that Rory had done his knee, that Chris was badly, really badly bleeding and bruised. Um, so it was it was an extremely sad team room. It was really, um, yeah, it was it was shocking, actually. So um, so they're my memories of 20, that game in uh, Cardiff in 2010. The next morning, yeah, I went into the hospital to see, um, to see the guys. Yeah, it, was a, it wasn't great. Yeah, it was a proper war torn game, and like everyone still talks about that game today. Like we, I do a little like Christmas advent calendar, like of rugby memories. And somebody asked, "Can you do the Shane Williams?" Yeah. Under the of twenty ten, and as a Scotsman, I was like, "No," but I don't know anyway. So, <laughs> um, but as a Welshman, yeah. So, <laughs> and some men as well, by the sounds of it. So he was happy with that one. Um, Mark Dot McCarthy 09 has asked, "What is your favourite try ever? Could be a try you remember watching growing up, or just your the tr- favourite try you've ever scored." Ah, oh, mate, I can't even. I can't even really recall. Um, oh, yeah, I, I scored a I, my first test try was against Argentina. I a chip and chase. Um, Picho it was me and Picho vying for the ball, and I sort of bumped him on the line to, to score. That was probably, I guess that was probably my best try for Scotland. Uh, that was my first. I only got four tries, I think, in my 70, 67 games. Um, but, yeah, I'd probably say that one, as in for an individual try for me at that, you know, at, at the international level. I scored, you know, some uh, some good tries over the years, especially with Glasgow. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, as I said, I can't really pinpoint anyone in particular. No, that's fine. That's, that's still a good one. I, I kind of remember it was in the World Cup, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, that that uh, Murrayfield. So I think it was in, uh, I think they played us in either, two. Th- it was 2005, I'm pretty sure. It was either 2005 or four. So they, you know, they were back in the days where they had Contempomi and Picho, all those, um, you know, big names. They were just starting to come good um, in order there for their big 07 World Cup. Yeah, all right. I, that's a bit more for my time. And I proper started getting into rugby for the for those seven World Cups. So there we go. Sure. 
Um, last question from the fans. It's McNally Peter 06. Um, what was your greatest moment in a Connaught jersey? We kind of dabbled on it earlier, but just your greatest um, moment in a Connaught jersey. Um, Oh, well, yeah, there's a few. I think, again, I mentioned the Leinster game. I think it was in particular, it was my first year. I had some really nice moments when uh, you know, Eric El was, uh, Eric got me to Connacht and he was my coach in that first year. And we, as I said, the first game against Leinster was a big one. Um, I remember the second last game of the year, we played against Treviso away and we got ourselves in a real bind. We were sort of struggling because we were trying to get our Connacht's highest ever finish for a season. And, um, Anyway, long story short, we we ended up drawing against Treviso away. I think we were down by 10 points with like two minutes to go. And we uh, kicked a penalty goal and then um, um, Paul O'Donoghue scored a try under the post, like after full time. And we we got away with the draw. And I remember that sort of got us into eighth position. And then we we held that position. So we finished eighth of the year, which was, again, Connick's highest ever finish at the time. So that was a, I think that was a pretty good, um, you know, as in for a club, that was a, that was a good moment. And uh, and as I mentioned, some of those European victories were, were pretty special. We got one of them each year. We got one against um, yeah, big wins against the Frenchies, the Bristol, uh, Bristol, uh, Beeritz at home, and then uh, and then away against Toulouse was um, was unreal. And was that 2014, 13, 14? Yeah, yeah, all all good moments. And I could see Sean nodding and remembering it like every single yeah. one. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> like that. That's that's all the fan questions. That's that's all the questions I've got. Sean, you got any last thoughts for for Dan? No, no, I don't have any more questions. Just just a big thank you, Dan, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. I um, but yeah, good on you guys. Good on you doing this. I uh, hope it all works out. You get much of a fan base, have you? It's, it's uh, getting there. It's growing slowly but surely. We'll get it's there. It's more on our individual TikTok accounts and social media as well. Yeah, the fan base. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's. Good. I think it's good, mate. It doesn't matter. I think it's good that there's people trying to raise awareness of the game. You know, at different times, I'm sure you realise over here in Australia, it's you know, rugby sort of hasn't been too great as in regards to. Um, you know, the commentary around it, as in the positivity. But um, you know, in more recent times. Certainly, since the Wallabies have, have played some good rugby in the last couple of months, you know it's it's been a lot more positive. So I think the more positivity we can give about you know any rugby, I think the better game. It's just it's too much negativity going on. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, we've all had it. We made a comment on a player that wasn't particularly playing great, and like we all got not hate, just needless stupid comments about stuff, and like like. What is the point? Like, is this what gets you like people going? That yeah, and it's the whole like safety thing. I do refereeing, and I talk a lot about refereeing and safety in rugby because I'm also doing nursing. So that's my big thing, like concussion stuff. And people just like, oh, rugby's gone soft, and you just say to them, no, it's not gone soft. It's players are so much bigger and stronger that it needs to be safer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think on that debate, like you could debate that for hours. Unfortunately, oh, I... that's that's. The way the, the way the way the game is, that's the way the world's going, you know, regards to sport and, and, and everything else. It's it's just part of life now. You know, back in the old days when you didn't have a lot of this research and understanding about different injuries and you know all the rest of it, um, it was just part of the game. You know, you hear people yeah. call, but it's older people, it's just part of the game. But yeah, the reality is is that um, you know, some of these hits you see, as you said, you know, guys with the different techniques and you know, that's what that's how certain teams are coached to be so particular about what they do and if they get ever so slightly wrong you know you could have very serious injuries going on and that's you know you see it in every game like there's been some games where um you know some of the referees have given yellows or even reds and you think gosh there's not much in that but the reality is if it went wrong there would be a lot to do with it and it could be really really serious and i think that's where it's um where it's sort of at and it's just a sign of the times unfortunately that's just the way it is we've got to roll with it and it's all about safe, player safety. It's still a tough game. Ask any player that plays. I'm sure they're not saying, oh, that was soft. It's still bloody tough. No, there's some big... I mean, I referee and like even like... You can make a huge hit still going low. And that's the thing I always say. You can still put in a huge shift, but just do it legally. I think I think the issue is, is that, you know, you just mentioned it there, going low. You can go low and still get sent off because a bloke falls, falls poorly. His face is in the wrong area. It, it can happen, but unfortunately, that can happen in any sport. It doesn't matter what it is. It can happen yeah. anywhere. You know, you could knee someone in the head, 
just by what I said, you can need them without even realizing you need them because they've fallen, unfortunately, but you're the man that hit him. You know, it, it sucks because it doesn't seem right. But I, I think if you if you listen to a lot of referees, especially when they explain, you know, look at me, uh, the majority of them, when they when something happens, most of them explain it pretty pretty clearly what the situation is and why they've done it. And that's just that's just the reality of the situation we're in. That's that, that's yeah, the sanction. 100%. You know, there's mitigating circumstances, blah, 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 blah. It's only going to be yellow. So I think players more and more, you know, are recognising. And I think it's it, the frustration is when there's a red card and you just sort of shake your head thinking, yeah, wow, that's um, it's not ideal. But I can tell you, as a referee, I'm pretty sure, you know, they don't want to be doing this. They just have to because that's what they're mandated to do. Now, yeah, literally, we always, that's one thing I've always said. I don't make the laws. I just enforce them. Yeah. That's the thing. A lot of referees say that as a thing. Oh, well, keep at it, mate. It's good to hear. You know, there's again, there's not enough referees. You know, there's not many people putting their hand up to do it. They get slagged off, but not too many people put their hand up to do it either. Oh, I love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, um, what was I going to say? That? Oh, you, you made a point just, I think it was Murray, you said something about, uh, um, you know, people slagging off, you know, negativity and blah, blah. I, I remember in Australia when I was, um, you know, when I was coming through like a youngster, when, if you played poorly, you yep. know, you weren't, it wasn't reported on. You weren't talked about. Yeah. If you played well, you were celebrated. That's what we talked about was the player that played well. Glasgow played yeah. Connacht and Connacht win 45 to 20. Let's talk about the Connacht players who played well. Who yeah. cares if someone played poorly? He'll get picked up by his coaches and, you know, whatever. It's, that, that bugs me that we have to hone in on the negative part of it. If we're trying to make the game bigger and better and yeah. more accessible, lots of people and try and raise interest about it let's talk positively that's that's where i get frustrated the most and always it always has been a frustration of mine no i, I agree i mean you you know yourself i mean the, i'm not dabbling into in depth but like that's why your international career ended because people were just picking on you and it was all your fault and like, there's 15 men on our team again just praise england don't look at the negatives and even yes. today, you, even today, you get like, for example, like Edinburgh could get beat next week, and you'll get fans in the comments. Oh, Mike Blair doesn't know what he's doing. I'm like, what are you on about? Like, he's sec- like you said earlier, he's second in the league, and yeah. like even, even Scotland levels, like you slip up against South Africa, who are world champions. People are like, oh, Gregor Townsend's not the right man. I'm like, right, but Donald yeah, down the road, but down, that, Donald down the road. Unfortunately. Murray, unfortunately, that will never change. Like that's just the that's just the reality. You no, know, no. it's it's it is it's it's what um it's what sells. So I was going to say, when know, it comes to media, more, what gets money, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I guess at the end of the day, mate, you're if you're at that level, you're putting yourself out there, you're exposed, and you've got to be um you've got to be accepting of it. It's gonna it's gonna happen. You're not gonna, you know, I don't know too many people that got away with their whole career without you know copying any criticism. So that's just the part and parcel of the game, and. Unfortunately, it is part of it, and um, you just got to deal with it. You know, as I said, I had to deal with it in my career, and, yeah. and now there's the next wave of people who, you know, we talked about Finn. Like I'm sure Finn has copped his criticism over time, but you know, he, he's a exciting player that probably is in World Rugby just about at the moment. Yeah, hundred percent. Just, just basically, don't be a dick to people for no reason. That's, that's it. Not basically the story to it, but. Yeah. Honestly, thank you so much for this opportunity, Dan. It's been a great chat and all the great. best for the season with the Colts and have a great Christmas as well. Yeah, thanks, boys. Merry Christmas to you. And um, yeah, thanks for the chat. Thanks for reaching out. The <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, guys. Cheers, Dan. This has been later. Rugby later. Connection Podcast Interview Thursday with Dan Parks. And we will see you next time.